November 1581, Paris. It is three months now since Henry and Alençon fled the palace under perilous circumstances. A messenger arrived 10 days after their departure with the news that they had both arrived safely in Iraq, and I have never been so relieved. I had hoped that after mother's initial fury had subsided, she would reconcile herself to the fact that his, of his departure and allow me to join him. I had been assured that that would be the case once they had sorted out a few things. Yet I am still here. It is clear what is happening. Immediately upon having returned to Navarre, Henry reversed course and declared himself a Huguenot again. He had been forced to say he was a Catholic. I don't know what this means to his immortal soul, but I do know what it means to Charles and Miller, that my alliance with him makes me a threat, and as a result, I am to be held prisoner in the palace. Perhaps prisoner is overstating it. It's not as if there are guards at the gate, and I may traverse Paris freely, but they will delegate no funds for a journey to Narok, no retinue to escort me there, and I certainly can't walk there by myself. It causes me, regrettably, to feel a certain amount of pique toward Henry. <laughs> Didn't he realize his, the troubles his renunciation of the true faith would cause me? I have had time, therefore, to reflect at length, not only upon my state, but indeed the state of so many titled women whose fate I have observed over the years and read about in history. If my tone sounds somewhat bitter, I apologize. <laughs> I am lonely and sad. It seems to me, upon reflection, that a young princess is given two messages growing up. There are, the, there are in truth many trivial messages imparted to one regarding comportment and daily life, but these are the two that resound most deeply within the young soul. Message number one, you are of enormous importance. As the offspring of the king and queen, you are placed in the highest regard at court your every whim catered to. You live in magnificent surroundings that reflect the illustrious history of your ancestors, the blood of whom you are constantly reminded runs through your veins. You are educated to the highest degree possible, surrounded by a retinue of servers and waiting ladies, flattered and admired by suitors, attired in the highest fashion, and given pride of place at every public event. When you travel, it is with all pomp and ceremony, in the company of a retinue which frequently numbers in the hundreds. This, I'm sure you might imagine, serves to build up within a, this, you might imagine, serves to build within the average princess a certain self-regard, except for the fact that it collides with the following. <laughs> Message number two, you are of no importance whatsoever. <laughs> Interestingly, this message is conveyed to you concurrently with message, message number one. Yes, you will be educated, but the knowledge you acquire will be of no interest to anyone, <laughs> except insofar as it may aid in the acquisition of a husband. Your father, the king, may dandle you on his knee and make you laugh for a few brief moments, creating a cherished memory you will never forget, but then he will dismiss you and go off to fight a war, or commence a year-long tour of the country with his men or fight in a joust and be impaled through the eye with a javelin, and die <laughs> and leave you fatherless. As you grow, your mother will find you to be an annoyance and focus her attention entirely on your brothers. Your ladies may flatter, courtiers may write letters of love to you, but this is because in addition to being a princess, you've somehow managed not to acquire the crippling congenital defects of your siblings. <laughs> Beautiful baubles delight those to whom beauty is all. No one, except possibly your governess, will see your mind as a valuable resource, and why should they? It's not as if you'll ever inherit the throne. The Salic laws of France forbid it. Then, when you are deemed ripe enough for picking, you will be discarded. The first moment an acceptable offer is made for your hand. That alliance accomplished, no one will give you a second thought, until the day you return for, say, a state funeral. In short, you are from the moment you are born, a chess pawn for the more powerful to play as they deem expedient. Yes, I am angry. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't expect pity. I understand that there are a great many people who would sacrifice all to be a princess of France. 
I am merely pointing out that life as a chess pawn has its demerits. <laughs> <laughs>